Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show. Uh, we talk a lot about education on uh, hot air. We talk a lot about education policy, academia bailouts, uh, the uh, the woke, uh, the wokery that goes on here, and we have been lamenting. We've been actually sort of praying for somebody to set academia right. I'm here to tell you that that might be happening right now in Austin, Texas, actually, which is fairly interesting. Jacob Howland's with us today to talk to us about the uh, University of Austin in Texas, UATX. Uh, if you are keeping score, that's uaustin.org is the website. And this is, um, Jacob, I saw this, um, I, I think it was in proposal form or sort of like a um, investor um you know, you know, request for investment sort of form. A couple of years ago, I was writing about uh, one of my favorite movies, The Emperor's Club, um, which talks about sort of the degradation of classic uh, classical education. And I happen to mention the fact that, no, oh, uh, this is a really interesting development. And I'm glad to see that this is proceeding apace. Looks like you guys are on, on track here. You're already holding um, some coursework at the uh, University of Austin. Yeah. Uh, well, first, thanks, Ed, for having me on. I'm very happy to talk about UATX, commonly known as the University of Austin. Uh, so, yeah, last summer, you know, we had our forbidden courses, um, which were primarily for college students. There were a couple who were in sort of graduate school range. Um, and uh, we had some really interesting courses dealing with things like uh, sexuality. We just posted a debate between Kathleen Stock and Deirdre McCloskey on transsexuals. Um, and we're running it again this summer. We had a tremendous interest from students. Last summer, in fact, uh, they were so excited that uh, they spontaneously formed an alumni council, uh, which they constituted to give advice to us. Wow. Um, and we've been using them in various ways. They elected their own officers. Um, this summer, we've got a, a great list. We've got Glenn Lowry teaching on race. We've got Walter Russell Mead teaching on foreign policy. Matthew Crawford, who wrote Shopcraft as Soul, Soulcraft, is teaching a course for us. Um, and that's just a small spattering of, uh, of offerings. But we're also running, uh, for the first time, uh, a three-day intensive class uh, or classes for high school students here in Austin. Both of these events will be in June. Uh, and people can apply from anywhere around the country. We're calling it Intellectual Foundations, which is also the name of our core uh, liberal studies program that we're going to begin at the University of Austin. So, um, you know, and those courses will be on things like Hamlet, um, Trial of Socrates, really substan intellectually substantial things. So we're really excited about that. Well, this kind of gets into what I was talking about to introduce this, which was, you know, I... I I don't know. Have you ever seen the movie The Emperor's Club with Kevin Klein? And um, I have not. I mean, I've seen Dead Poets Society and things like that. You know, you know it, great, yeah. Dead Poets Society. It got confused with Dead Poets. Not so much confused with, but it, 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 the way that they marketed it was really poorly. And it was it was marketed as sort of a Dead Poets Society sort of movie. It really is actually the opposite. This is about the about the value of classical education and the threats to it from within and without. And it's based on Ethan Kanan's The Palace Thief, which mm -hmm. was actually a darker look at that. It's, um, uh, they, they kind of tacked on his redemption thing at the end on the movie, which it doesn't really fit the material, but that's okay. It's still a great movie. But it talks about the fact that, you know, the, the classical education has become less relevant, not because it is less relevant, but because we've stopped valuing the things that classical education was supposed to be about. You know, the the institutions of a republic, the uh, the, the intellectual foundations of modern thought, the Enlightenment, that sort of thing. And you talk about doing the trial of Socrates and for high school students, and I'm wondering if you see the same issue and if this is in part, a, an attempt to sort of uh, provide a remedial classical education um, project, I guess you could say, for those who are going to be entering higher education. It's interesting you mentioned the word remedial because this actually is one of our concerns. Um, you know, education is broken on multiple levels in the United States, and, and one major area in which it is broken is K through 12. Um, and I've often thought that, you know, we could, 
I mean, our plan at UATX is really to help revive higher education. And I think we've been doing that. We've already, um, you know, I think encouraged a number of other institutions or projects that are along the same lines as ours that want to reinstate liberal education, also with a view toward invigorating um, the development of 21st century skills and kind of entrepreneurship and so forth, which I can talk a little bit about later. I think there's an interesting tension, a kind of fruitful tension between those two things. But um, I've often thought that, you know, if we don't fix K through 12, we're really going to be in deep, deep trouble in this country. And so why would you need remedial education? Well, it's not just that students um, are learning less of the stuff that somebody my age and I, you know, was in grammar school in the 1960s and 1970s uh, would have learned, for example, in civics. Um, also an exposure to American classics like Tom Sawyer and things like this. Right. Um, but that, in fact, they are being taught to repudiate uh, the past. And um, they're, they're given uh, a framework of interpretation that closes them off in advance to the text because they already know that um, Thomas Jefferson owned slaves or something like this that would simply sort of um, already color their interpretation of what the founding fathers, for example, might have to say. When they come to the University of Austin, we're going to take uh, an approach which this sounds extremely simple, but is actually thousands of years old, which is you treat the text with humility, you open yourself to it, you take it on its own terms, you don't approach it with a theoretical structure uh, of interpretation that's designed to find only those things you already believe are in there, um, whether they're teachings about race or class or sexuality or whatever. And I think that, that you know, now I think that remedial education can work and it can work fairly quickly. Uh, and part of the reason I think it can work is that if you read in the time tested way that I'm suggesting, you will discover a certain joy in learning, which we have deprived yeah. our students from, uh, of. And, uh, I, you know, so once students start getting used to the idea that, wow, this is exciting. There are great ideas here. We're having an open discussion. <laughs> we can say what we think and we're free to make mistakes. They're going to have fun in class. And that's not a word you associate with K through 12 education today. Well, to be honest with you, I didn't think it was a, a word that I would have associated with K through 12 education when I was going through K through 12 education. And that was quite a few decades ago, Jacob. Um, but you know, I, I, mean, I, I get that. And I think that one thing, you know, just as an aside here, not really, even really an aside, 40 years ago, a little about 42 years ago, really, I was on the student faculty curriculum committee at Cal State Fullerton, which is where I, I went to college and I didn't graduate from it, but it was one of the things I was volunteering to do. It was a very interesting um, committee to sit on and I, I very much enjoyed my time there. And remedial classes were just getting proposed for the first time while I was on that. And the, the people around the table, and I have to say myself included, even at 18 years of age or so, that, uh, which is what I was at at the time, wondered aloud why they were doing remedial education at a university when first off K through 12 should already be producing students that are ready for this type of, for, you know, 100 level classes, um, uh, you know, a level of education, but also why these students weren't just going to a local community college for whatever remedial um uh, work that they needed to do. And it ended up passing. They ended up adding these things. They called them 99 courses, right? Rather than such and such 100, they become, you know, English 99. Um, so they didn't have the remedial tag on it. Um, so politically correct back then too. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, first off, it's gotten worse. I think, I think even objectively speaking, that issue has gotten worse. And uh, depending on which state you're in, incredibly worse. And I think it's in part because of lots of different social, you know, ills that are going on, family breakdowns and all that kind of thing. But I also think that just people don't expect too much out of kids. And that's the reason why I'm looking at the forbidden coursework that you're talking about here, for forbidden courses at uh, University of Austin in Texas, UATX.org. And what I get from that, <laughs> you know, you're going to have 18 year olds in this class. And Jacob, you expect more from these kids. 
And you think that um, they're going to expect more out of themselves too. And I, I actually find that to be a very interesting approach in this day and age. Yeah, look, I mean, so last year I was privileged to teach one of the forbidden courses. My course was called uh, The Opium of Ideology. And we were reading, you know, we started with Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor, of course. And, you know, but we were reading Cheswav Miwash, The Captive Mind. We were reading Raymond Aron, um, Intellectuals in Search of a Religion. Uh, these are uh, challenging texts. We read a great book by Alain Besançon called A Century of Horrors, which primarily focuses on communism, which, as you know, was really swept under the rug. I mean, I think it's yes. it's, it's sort of given this, it's been given a pass. It never had the kind of reckoning that Nazism had with the Nuremberg trials and so forth. Um, but these were intellectually challenging ideas. Now, we had great students. I mean, quite a few were from the Ivies, um, you know, Hillsdale, the Wyoming Catholic, other kinds of really good schools, but um, they were stretched. And I think that's the idea. Let me let me go back though and say, look, I take your point at about um, most uh, students, you know, even even of my generation wouldn't say, oh, school is fun. But what I wanted to say by that is that I think we were lucky enough, at least I'm speaking for myself, to have three or four teachers who really <laughs> turned us on intellectually. You know, um, they were serious about the subject and they loved it and they poured themselves into teaching. Um, my wife was a public school teacher for 25 years. Um, I have nieces who are public school teachers. What I hear from public school teachers is they're not able increasingly to do what they got into the business to do. Right. They want to impart knowledge. They want to help kids. They want to see the excitement in children's eyes when they, when they develop intellectual capabilities. Um, and yes, there's been a huge slip in standards. Many universities, by the way, are now, I mean, for example, I just read Columbia now says no more SATs, zero. You can't submit them. Um, plenty yeah. of schools are sort of following this. So academic standards and academic rigor are slipping away in the name of things like equity, um, which, of course, as we all know, it's been made clear means, you know, equal outcomes. Um when that's been tried in the past, it tends to mean a leveling down, not a leveling up. Um, so, um, and I don't think it's good for students at all. Um, you know, if you sort of shift over to the realm of the body and athletics, there is um, a sense of competence, uh, of accomplishment, and a kind of pride that comes through being able to, in, to um uh, improve one's athletic performance or um, discover what one's capable of physically. Right. We take those things away from kids when we set the bars low. Um, and I think we take them away from adults as well. <laughs> I think you're right. I mean, I mean, and I think you're right about leveling down. I mean, I think the point is leveling down. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you lower standards, the point, uh, you know, for, for equity's sake, I think the point is leveling down. I think that's that's clearly the point. Um, and I think the administration just the other day said something about, maybe, maybe it was yesterday, said something about equity explicitly being about uh, equal outcomes rather than equal right. you know, access, equal opportunity. And I mean, there's simply no way to do that in a free market type of um, society. It, in free access, free association, and um, and honestly that that sells everybody short because everybody's got strengths right and the idea in life is to try to find those strengths and and really be turned on by them like like you said with you know with, with teachers yeah i could name three or four of them right off the right off the top of my head that that really communicated a passion really were supportive really were inspiring um it's tough to be in that system and that's i mean that's what you're looking to change here with the university of austin um uaustin.org again. Um, and I, I guess maybe I put the cart a little bit in front of the horse because I really wanted to get into these issues, Jacob, but maybe you can tell us about what, how you came to form um, the University of Austin and you know how this came to be and, and what your vision is for it going forward. Yeah, great. So those are big questions. Um, now, I didn't come in on the ground floor. Uh, I, I joined uh, basically the 1st of May of 2022. But I can tell you that the university was formed. Um, Barry Weiss, and, as I understand the story, Barry Weiss, formerly of the New York Times, right? Now she has right. established something called the Free Press. 
um, Pano Canelas, who was the former president of St. John's, and uh, Joe Lonsdale, who is our now our chairman of the board. Uh, he's he's a very successful entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and so forth. Um, had a meeting in Austin, and um, we're discussing uh, the collapse of higher education. And as I understand it, uh, Barry Weiss said, well, we have to found a new university. And Pano said, well, who's going to do that? And Barry said, you are. Like, who else Who else is going to do it? So Pano decided to take it on. And, and, and Joe said, OK, I'm going to give you, you know, $10 million right off the bat, and we'll start from there. Um, what I like about this story is that it's an entrepreneurial response to a human need. Um, and I think one of the things that's great about America is our entrepreneurial spirit. People right. see a problem and they address it, you know. And this goes all the way back to Tocqueville. I mean, this is this is an observation of the American character. Um, and we've also integrated that spirit into our curriculum. So we've talked about liberal arts and liberal studies. And we have a very robust liberal studies program called Intellectual Foundations, uh, of which I am the director, as well as the chief academic officer of UATX. Um, but in addition, we have something called the Polaris Project, named after the North Star. And this is a four-year project that runs sort of a through line that goes through the university. Um, and it involves students identifying a human need, something that really needs to be addressed, something that's going to serve the human good. Um, and then making, doing, discovering, building, creating whatever it is that will address that need. Um, now, the standards are going to be very rigorous, and the students in undertaking these projects will be connected with outside mentors. We're producing, by the way, something called the Innovation Network, which is uh, hopefully hundreds of employers who um, take a pledge to work with our students, to give them apprenticeships, um, to consider them for jobs and so forth. But the idea is, Ed, that um, these, these are going to be projects that they could be social services, they could be someone who wants to address the problem of homelessness, create a scalable model of new education K through 12, could be a technical device, could be starting a company, could be starting a visiting, you know, doing a film documentary or something. We want them to achieve all the skills that are necessary to carry through on that project. But what's great about it is they see a need, they formulate a goal, they begin to think about means toward that goal, they begin to implement it. And they realize, as all entrepreneurs do, that well, they're going to have to adjust the goals and the means, and that's going to be a constant process. Right. We're going to teach them to try, to fail. Samuel Beckett said, try harder, fail, fail better, you know, <laughs> try again. <laughs> fail better. And really, you know, in this way, incidentally, develop their characters, humility, patience, stick to itiveness, a sense of responsibility, getting out into the world, contacting external mentors, they all have to, and making a public case to the public, right, uh, on some kind of public platform as to what the project is, how they conceived it, how they executed it, and why they undertook it. And the last thing I want to say about this is the University of Austin is itself a Polaris project. We saw a human need. Higher education is in trouble. We believe a new institution and one that can be a model for others is needed. We began to advance that way. We, just, we started out by saying freedom of speech, freedom of discourse, freedom of conscience. And we quickly realized that that's a good goal, but it's not adequate. You have to have a kind of human anthropology. You have to understand what yeah. the human good is and, and, and you know how human beings flourish. And there, You've got to go to the tradition. You've got to understand the tradition uh, because that's where the great and precious repository of wisdom lies um, that addresses these issues. And I, I, one more thing I want to say about this, incidentally, is so you might think of us as kind of like this Roman god, Janus. He looks backwards and forwards. The Romans had this god that sort of was facing the past and taking the ways of the fathers, then facing forward into the future. And it's our conviction that you know, the greatest innovations grow out of the soil of the past and of the tradition. And if you take away that soil, uh, you're blind. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there is a line and again, it's, it's, it's not original to the, to the movie I was mentioning earlier, but it is mentioned in there, which is, um, oh. the line is to, um, to grow up without an understanding of the past is to forever remain a child, right? Because, 
you you just don't have any foundation on which to build. Nobody builds something entirely from scratch. Everything is standing on the shoulders of of what came before. Uh, you know, even the innovators will tell you that. Um, and so part of that, I think, is is what is actually ailing us in the last forty years, fifty years, uh, however you want to put this. The idea that we can completely cut ourselves off from the past or completely treat it as though it's poisoned and it is um, it is therefore unusable to us. We must create everything anew. Uh, is to is to keep people in basic childhood. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm so glad you put it that way because infantilization is one of the major problems of universities today. Right. Um, you know this this demand for trigger warnings, safe spaces, the idea that words can actively cause harm. And I'm, you know, um, obviously I'm not talking about the most extreme situations, but, you know, reading, I don't know, uh, books that you and I would have found completely uh, uncontroversial five years ago might traumatize a student and therefore shouldn't be read and so forth. This, um, this is um, both um, crippling to individual development, if in fact we value being adults, which means taking responsibility, formulating our own goals, uh, you know, um, um, developing our capacities, developing the thick skin that we're going to need for reality. Because once you get out of a college, <laughs> you know, uh, you're going to meet lots of people. Um, or alternatively, I suppose you might just withdraw into a cocoon and not and sort of not be able to interact with them, which would be no good for anyone. Um, so, you know, I think this is a really serious issue. And one of the things that we want to do at UATX is to help people develop to sort of catapult their capacities, you know, and 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 and, and help them really um, achieve um, something meaningful in life. I mean, I think you know Aristotle's right that you know happiness is a matter of of meaningful activities, and um, I think we also have a deficit of meaning today. Right. But a lot of our meaning comes from the notion that we're doing something important and good. And we want to take the stuff that students learn in college out into the world and show that it actually matters, which is something universities have been doing, but only in a negative way, right? What happens right. in universities does matter, unfortunately, because it's poisoning the culture. We want to turn that around and put a plus sign where there was a minus. So uh, University of Austin at Texas, UATX, excuse me, uaustin.org. Got to make sure I get the URLs correct, uaustin.org. Um do you, is this developing into a type of four-year college where you're going to, um, I mean, I'm not sure exactly where the development is on this. Obviously, you have a location, you're, you're holding classes. Um, is this a, is, is this going to be, or is it already a four-year type of university where you could have multiple tracks? Multi, is, that, is that the vision going forward here? That is the vision, and we are working toward that vision. Our plan is to open our doors in the fall of 2024. Um, and, uh, but <laughs> right now we are working with the state of Texas to get a certificate of authority to open our doors and actually call ourselves a university and reach out to students. And that's why we, you know, officially we are UATX. Again, we are commonly known as the University of Austin. Um, now, one of the things that's happening here is we're dealing with bureaucrats in Texas sure. who evidently have not the state has not opened a new liberal arts university in something like 60 years. So they really don't know how to handle this. And um, um, we're facing sort of bureaucratic obstacles, uh, which I won't go into detail about, but we hope to overcome them. Um, the problem is going to be even bigger if and when we go for national accreditation. And that's a whole nother sure. story because yeah. frankly, accreditation, both on the state level and especially the national level, um, exercises, um, you know, what the economists and, uh, you know, uh, maybe political theorists, people study business call regulatory capture, right? Which is they're yep. there to protect the existing institutions. And there's another problem, Ed. I was just at a conference at, at, um, run by the Defense of Freedom Institute um, on accreditation in Washington, D.C., and that national system really is broken. And one of the reasons it's broken is that they're interweaving DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout the whole of universities. This is a huge issue. 
Uh, the good news is there's been a lot of backlash. We're very happy to see other institutions, um, you know, which in general, that is to say, in their newness and their attempt to create something new uh, and enter the field of higher education, in many cases, going back to the tradition, uh, schools uh, like Ralston College or New College in Florida or um, the Centers for Civics at the University of North Carolina. I think there's going to be one at Tennessee. I understand there are going to be many more. And they'll go through battles with faculty and administrators. But that's very promising. And the, and the reason is that it, it, it shows a great demand on the part of the American people for traditional education, for education that grounds us in, in the best that has been thought and said, that exposes us also to the worst, right? Allows us to have a genuinely critical perspective, one that is in, in the sort of moderate middle ground of correctly assessing and esteeming what we got right, addressing what we got wrong, uh, and moving forward, you know? Um, and as I say, I mean, this really is the source for good innovations. I, I um, the artist Salvador Dali, who, I mean, as you know, he had watches sort of melting on tree branches and stuff like that, <laughs> regardless of what you think of his art. He once said, paradoxically, anything that is not tradition is plagiarism, which you read, you're like, what, what are you talking about? But what he meant was that the blood of reality, as he put it, circulates in the tradition. And if you don't know the tradition, I mean, we see this in music, for example, you're right. not going to be able to produce something new and exciting. And that's just the way it is. That's a really good way of putting it. Um, by the way, if you want to uh, get around the uh, Texas issue, I, I, I live in Texas now, so I guess I can I guess I can make Texas jokes. Uh, what you really need to do is tell them you got a football team and that they play every Saturday afternoon and... <laughs> <laughs> right. The doors will open for you, my friend. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it, I'm not excited about uh, uh, imagining ourselves as being the uh, sort of warm up game for uh, Texas A&M or the University <laughs> of Texas or for that matter, Baylor University as terrific as those schools are. I don't uh, <laughs> think anybody who comes to UATX wants to be a doormat for 300 pound linemen and so forth. So they're already pretty smart is what you're saying. The people who come to ATX are already pretty brilliant. At least in right. that regard. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I mean, but I mean, when you're telling me that, that this was concept, right? A year and a half ago, this was pretty much concept. And you're going to go from concept to opening the doors, assuming that you can get over all the regulatory hurdles. And you know, it's not... An, that's not an inconsiderable assumption, but I mean, you're aiming to get doors open on a four-year learning institution in what two and a half years? That's yeah, yeah, Look, that's amazing. Well, we've been going great guns. I mean, we have uh, I, I don't know the exact figures, but we've essentially been pledged um, over a hundred million dollars. We've already got in hand something like 30 million bucks in cash. Um, wow. So we have the money to make it work. We have had uh, many people coming to us and 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 wanting, you know, <laughs> to, to give us money to do things that they would like to see done. Um, and that includes um, institutes for sort of special kinds of studies and energy institute. Um, we are um, currently um, thinking about uh, founding and working toward founding uh, an institute of Middle Eastern studies. But what's cool about that is it does it's not going to be anything like uh, the Institute of Middle Eastern Studies at a typical Ivy League school, which, you know, as you know, it's they're interested in Arab Israeli conflicts and sure Islam and so forth. But the folks who have come to us are. Um, people from the Middle East, Egyptian, Coptic, Christians. Um, self-identified as Syrians or Persians. These are folks who are particularly interested in the preservation of very ancient peoples and their traditions, languages, cultures, art, literature, etc. That's a very different approach. And that kind of an institute has a sort of space that would be open to lots of other peoples from the Middle East of different religions. Um, so that I think, I mean, I think what's neat about, we, we were trying to come up with another name than Middle Eastern Studies, but what's nice about that is then people are sort of, you know, I, I think this will be a common experience with UATX. People will hear something and say, oh, you've got that. And then when they find out what's involved, they realize it's a new twist. It's different. It's, it's not going to fall into the same ruts of, let's say, over politicization or you know debates that are really not academically fruitful and aren't aren't doing uh, the act of 
sort of preservation of what's important and, and, and providing models for going forward and so forth. That's just fascinating to me. And I think that that, you know, it's, that's one thing that's kind of missing, I think, in academia is that there's been a sort of, well, lack of competition is one way of putting it, but it's sort of a stasis, sort of a, um, a sort of a conventional approach for most colleges. And maybe this is a function of accreditation too. I mean, that, that's, it's possible that that's one of the things that's influencing this where, yeah, you go to the Ivies and you might get a, you know, a better education than you do at some of the state schools and stuff like that. But primarily you're getting the same perspective and the same approach at school after school, after school, after school. Now there's certainly differences and, you know, some schools are better than others. And, and that's certainly the case, but I don't know that there's a whole lot of uh, heterodox in academia in any of these subjects any longer, or even heterodoxical approaches to them. Um, and, and I think it's, I think that what academia needs is some fresh perspectives, some fresh blood and a little bit of competition in, in those regards. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I mean, look, if you take a place like Yale or Harvard, um, these, in these institutions still have world-class researchers um, yep. and um, very bright students. And I'm convinced that you can get an education. But, but the problem is that the overall atmosphere of the school is um, definitely not heterodox. You're not, um, you're getting uh, sort of always the same kinds of approaches. I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, a young woman uh, who works for us here at UATX, she founded um, a magazine at the University of Chicago called The Chicago Thinker. And um, she was, uh, she majored in Russian and East European studies. She actually won an award for her honors thesis, which was on the show Trials of Stalin. And she was in a class I taught recently uh, for the Hertog Foundation, which is an excellent foundation. And um, they've got a program called Hertog at Humanities. And I've been teaching Dostoevsky the last three years for them. So anyway, this course was on Notes from Underground. She told me how refreshing it was to read Dostoevsky without being told in advance, as she was at the University of Chicago, now watch out for this guy. He's a kind of religious zealot. He's a Slavophile. He's got bigoted ideas. Okay, now let's open the Brothers Karamazov. You know, <laughs> that's not the way to read Dostoevsky, you know. Or anybody. Um, or anybody, exactly. So what I want to say about the Hertog courses is they run in January and February. The students are in school for the most part. Half of them are from the Ivies. They, they have to write papers for these classes. They don't get credit for them. They're reading 750 page Russian novels, for example. Why are they coming to her talk? Because they can't get it at their schools. Yeah. Otherwise they would be getting credit for their classes and they would have the leisure of studying over 15 weeks and so on and so forth. So, and, and you know, incidentally, this is even happening in the sciences as I'm sure you know. Uh, we have a, a woman who's, um, a supporter of ours named Anna Krylov. She grew up in the Soviet Union and she's been writing about, well, you could call it the Sovietization of the sciences, right? That yep. political correctness, DEI, all these things are taking over. And what that means is pretty soon there's not going to be any refuge anywhere. I say refuge because in the Soviet Union, you know, a lot of people went into science because they saw what was happening and they thought they would be undisturbed there. But for example, in the late 1930s, when all the faculty of the uh, in astronomy at you know the University of Leningrad and the University of uh, Moscow where, where most of them were arrested well that proved not to be the case um, right so, yeah yeah no I mean I, I mean I, I I mean I don't want to overstate this because we're not rounding up the we're not rounding up the dissident professors here in the United States thank goodness for that but there has been sort of a um uh, a Sovietization in the approach, right? And this is getting back to DEI and and all of this, where you are, where, where you're on campus and you can't even speak freely. Even if you're tenured, you can't speak freely about um, about dissenting from from the orthodoxy, even in your own discipline, let alone the broader political climate and that sort of thing. And uh, I forget which I think was it was it UC Santa Barbara I think was trying to. Um, strip one of their professors of tenure for basically just having a political disagreement <laughs> it's like you're basically arguing against tenure altogether if you're if, if tenure doesn't represent some sort of you know protection formal protection against backlash 
uh, for, you know, bad think, then what's the purpose of tenure at all? And, yeah. and I mean, we can have a debate about the purpose of tenure or, and the value of tenure, but it's a value that academia has said is, you know, one of their primary values. And yet, uh, I think the Sovietization that you're talking about, it's really, it's, it's undermining everything else in academia. And it's the reason why having something like UATX is going to be really critical going forward in the next few years. Yeah, look, I mean, I mean, um, our view is not that um, ideas of the sort that um, many Americans would object to, I mean, let's say DEI okay. and things like that, um, shouldn't have any place on campus. All we're saying is that if you want to, um, if you believe that diversity, equity, inclusion are important goals and this should be top of the list of priorities and so forth, well, you also better you also better believe that it's acceptable for people to ask you for your arguments, to offer their critical responses, to give their best reasons why that's you know they don't believe that that's so, uh, and you're not going to silence them, and you're not going to hound them, and you're not going to report them. Obviously, we're not going to have any reporting mechanisms for bad think at the University of Austin, and you're not going to declare certain ideas off limits because we're convinced as John Stuart Mill was, that if you actually have the conditions in which you can have rational debate and discussion, that the good ideas will win out. Um, and, and unfortunately, what we do not have on campus are dissenting voices. Th this is, this is, you know, we've been using the word Sovietization, and I'm sure many listeners may say, oh, this is really an overstatement. But what I mean by that is when heterodoxy is simply not tolerated, or if it should somehow appear, even though the university has taken measures to suppress it, um, it's attacked. And those who utter heterodox opinions are hounded, uh, you know, or investigated, which is a form of punishment in itself. Right. Um, you've got something a lot more, uh, you know, a lot less liberal than what we're looking for and a lot more in the direction of the way things worked under the Soviets. Exactly. And what did it produce? Intellectual stultification, a lack of innovation, a lack of a lack of critical thinking. And uh, that's what uh, UATX is hoping to avoid. We, I mean, I could sit here and do this for two hours because this is really fascinating, but I know you've got better things to do. So, uh, Jacob, why don't you give us a, a rundown of where, where people can go again to see what's going on at UATX. Uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, classes that you're doing and uh, what uh, where they can go in the future. Yeah, so um, you, again, you can go to uaustin.org. And there, if you click on pro, so actually, you can you can you can see what our board is. You can see who our center directors are. Uh, you can get an idea of our undergraduate curriculum. Um, but if you if you click on programs, you'll be able to see what the kinds of courses we're offering for forbidden courses are. We have tremendous guest speakers coming in as well. Um, I you know maybe there are like twenty different faces and names on there that 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 you can see and. Um, most of your listeners will recognize a lot of these people. You can click on um, programs and also find out about our high school programs, which students can apply to. Um, and um, uh, we're also revamping our website and we'll be putting a lot more content out there. Oh, incidentally, you can see a wonderful debate uh, between Kathleen Stock and Deirdre McCloskey, which I think has already gotten something. I mean, yesterday I checked, it had 65,000 views. Kathleen Stock, some of your listeners may know, was uh, pushed out of her university in England because she um, took issue with um, the notion that transsexual men, that is men who've transitioned to women, are actually women. Uh, and this um, got her uh, uh, in the in the sights of uh, British Antifa, right? Right. And, and she and, they, and the campus security told her, you, you know, you can't come to campus. Um, so last year, and, and that happened a number of years ago, and last year she said, you know, this is the first time I've ever had a debate with a transsexual. Deirdre McCloskey is a very well-known economist. Um, and, it, you know, it was actually a really very exciting and interesting debate, very cordial, two very different sets of views. Uh, and, um, um, you know, but Kathleen said, I mean, she had, she had, she'd never been subject, and she'd always been subject to hostility. And here she was in an environment in which 
they had this open and frank debate. And uh, so those are the kinds of things that, you know, let the ideas get out there. Let people talk. We don't even know how to talk to each other anymore. And that's one of the things that we really hope uh, our students can not only learn how to do themselves, but go out and be examples for the rest of the world. All right. Well, you know where to go. Uaustin.org. Tons of links there. They've got all sorts of different uh, ways to find out what's what's going on. Uh, lots of great programs coming up, and uh, they do accept applications from around the country, around the world, really. So don't let the don't let the Austin part fool you. You can anywhere that you're hearing this. You can go to um, uaustin.org and check that out. Jacob, thank you so much for being with us today. Great talking with you. Hey, Ed, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Now that the political infighting is over and the sausage is being made in the House, it's time for Republicans to unite with one cause and fight back against Joe Biden and his radical administration. The GOP has promised to investigate Biden, family corruption, the border, big tech censorship, collusion, the origins of COVID, the FBI, and intel agencies' attacks on the American people and more, and it's time to hold them to those promises. Here at Hot Air, we won't let up on holding them accountable. We unapologetically fight back against the radical left and squishy rhinos in Congress who fail the people. We bring you the truth and go to war against Biden's woke communist agenda, but we need your help. By becoming a VIP for uh, hotair.com, you can help us in this battle for our country. Just look at the House Democrats leader, Hakeem Jeffries. He's another divisive, radical leftist, and his communist Sesame Street speech proves it. If Republicans don't halt the Biden agenda and conservative media fails to hold them accountable, it could mean the end of our great country. Join us in the fight. Become a Hot Air VIP member or a VIP Gold member today and use the promo code SAVEAMERICA to receive a 40% discount on your membership. Stand with us and fight to save America. We will never give up. And thank you very much.